Joining us now as he has progressed from the mustard seats now up to his analyst role seat here on set in Studio B is Blaine is this, Fowler. Is this seat lower? I feel like you guys are looking down. Raise on it up, man. Lift it, raise it up. Raise it up. You raise can you get, me up. Can you get it up any further? There I go. I, can you move I just, the seat up any further? I, I felt like... Like, I can't get it up as far as Brian Logan needs it up, but it's probably okay for me. Right, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Look, we can see the size of your arms, Blaine. So I'm trying, okay. to, I'm trying to conceal them today. <laughs> there are many jokes there. Oh. Okay, first. B-Lo and I are having a contest still. Yeah. Still? Always. Yeah. Always. Absolutely. First and foremost, what did you think about that whole press conference with Kalani Satake? So you guys have mentioned this. The first thing that I was taken back by when I walked into the building, now I'm coming down as a member of the media and BYU TV to cover it, was how many of former players were just out in the in the hall? Like unsolicited, just showed up and said, we got to support this guy. And there was guys from the, the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, like current players, players that just finished. It was really, really impressive, and I, I think that that sent a message to Kalani that, hey, welcome home. Like, you're, you're, you're a brother. You played here. Um, once you played here, there's this brotherhood that exists that's always been there that ties you, no matter how far apart your playing time was, you're always brothers when you played at BYU. And, and uh, that was really evident when Kalani walked into the building. That really took me back a little bit. I was surprised. When um... – when Lavelle Edwards came into the room, there was an obvious certain amount of energy um, that came in there. But behind him came all of these players, and that's, that's the exact feeling I felt. And, and Bronco phrased that as band of brothers. But I really felt that. And Kalani was really strong in his comments about, I'm, go I'm going to bring you know, Le what Lavelle did, build on what Bronco did. I, so someone, someone said the, the following tweet at the beginning, and I thought, this was really good. I want to get your comment on this, Blaine. Um, and I can't find it now, but it, he said it felt like it was the the past, the present, and the future kind of coming together. All in one. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of felt that, too. I think that was – whoever tweeted that out did a great job of, like, capturing it in, in one statement. And and so it was really cool. And and Kalani, he's very gracious and, and very thoughtful. So I got to visit with him for quite a while afterwards back in, in, back in the green room and with the family and all that. And, uh, you know, he, he kept making sure I understood – that there's a lot of things that Bronco did that he wants to incorporate into what they're doing. There's a lot that he can take from that. Um, you know, Bronco turned around a program that was losing football games and, and turned that around and created a standard of excellence and a work ethic that needed to be there. And, and Lavelle, you know, Kalani played in the Lavelle era, so he has all kinds of things that he wants to incorporate from there. But he also wants to incorporate things he learned from Kyle Whittingham, things he learned from Gary Anderson, things he learned from all of the coaches that he's come across in the last 15 years and bring it all together. But in the end, culturally, he wants a family culture like he had at the University of Utah. And, and Kyle Whittingham established that because he came from Lavelle Edwards type of, of coach and it was so cool to have coach Edwards there to kind of support yeah let, we'll bring that part of this back we'll build on Bronco what he's done we'll build we'll bring back some of the things that Lavelle did and one plus one hopefully will equal three or four or five and launch this program you know into where they want to be now listening to everything he said during that uh, news conference it's hard not to think that recruiting is maybe priority 1A on his list <laughs> and priority 1B is like getting the assistance and all that in place. Maybe those are reversed, but what, what did you take away from priorities? Yeah, so what, what is the number one thing we know Kalani comes in here with? We've been talking, I've been crediting Number you. one thing. Recruiting. He is, yeah. he, is one, he is known in the business as one of the best recruiters in the country. And so that's the number one thing he brings to this job. He doesn't bring a ton of experience, but he brings that. To me, that is the most important thing a coach can do is, is load himself up with talent and then, then bring good assistance in that can coach that talent up. But if you can do that, you got a big part of it beat. If you're the most talented team on the field, you got a good chance to win if your kids will just execute decently. So he brings that. I mean, have you guys met Timberly, his wife? I, ha I haven't. So no. you meet Timberly, talk to her for five minutes, and you will know that this guy can recruit. Like, he is so – Kalani is so far above his head. He outkicked his coverage by a mile. So so the fact that when he was on campus, he could convince Timberly to marry him, he started recruiting right then, and he's never stopped. The best that sales guy – the best sales guy you've ever seen. If he recruited her, then, then that guy can get it done, right? And then – 
every place he's been, no matter where he's been, he's able to get quality talent. And I think it's because he is an unbelievably warm and sincere person. Mm -hmm. So when he sits down with a family, he's he's going to sit down with them and he's going to look those kids in the eye and he's going to say, just like he did in his press conference, I played here. I know what you can take out of this program and what you can be, you know, beyond this that you can't get any place else. He is going to he understands the uniqueness of this place. He understands what it did for him and he will do a fantastic job of very sincerely conveying that to the people sitting across from him. Um, that's what he's done every place he's been. You know, he felt that Utah was a special place when he was there because he was there and Kyle was there and people that, you know, and they sold that and they got a lot of big time recruits. He had a great recruiting class this last year at Oregon State. Now he comes home, a place that he really believes in. His sincerity and his warmth and his, his love of people is going to shine when he's in those homes recruiting people and they're going to want to come play here for Kalani. When you look at how he makes BYU better, obviously in recruiting, but how else will he make BYU better? I think that what – so recruiting is number one, right? So you put that aside. So you get – if you can upgrade the talent. And you know what? They, Bronco and his staff have done a really, really good job. If you can just add one or two or three more high-profile guys to each recruiting class, if you – so my son-in-law is a starting free safety at Stanford right now. He's going to go play in the Rose Bowl. We're going to go down and watch him in the Rose Bowl. Well, what if we get him, and he's on this team this year? What if we get, um, you know, the kid at SC that's starting at linebacker for them in this in, on this team right now? And what if you get two of the offensive or defensive linemen that are LDS from the University of Utah on this team? So what if we have four or five more really, really high-quality Division One starters on this team? That's the difference between being a top 25 program and being a top 10 program is four or five guys. And so if he can do that, that, that changes everything, right? So that's the first and most mm -hmm. important thing. Um, but then to create a culture, um, and, and I think that Bronco has done this. So this is one of the things that he wants to just take where Bronco has gone and just continue it. And that is the expectation for excellence, that you will work your butt off and you will perform at a high level. Because we saw the really, really nice Kalani today, but I've watched him mic'd up, and I've been by him on the sidelines when I've been doing sidelines at games. He is a very, very intense person, and he expects a production out of his folks. He expects them to perform. He expects excellence in everything that they do. I think that he'll bring that, and that's something that Bronco did that he did very well, and I think Kalani will continue that. You combine really, really good recruits with an expectation of excellence, and you get that together – now, now you've got a team that can compete. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've hit on the word I wanted to bring up next a couple of times, and that is expectations from Kalani Sitake facing that 2016 gauntlet of a schedule, which he said, I'm excited about that. That's what we want. ESPN's Joe Shad joined us earlier today and said, hey, nine wins on that schedule would be a really good season. I'm like, nine wins on that schedule would be unbelievable. That'd be, that'd be ridiculous. Unbelievable. Especially in your first year as a yeah. coach, right? So what, what are realistic, tempered expectations that BYU fans should take in year number one? With the right staff, and we don't know who that is yet. I even tried to push Tom Homo afterward to see, and they wouldn't give us any <laughs> insight on it. Um, with the right staff, this should be a one of the highest level offenses in the country next year. Because you're going to get Tanner Mangan back, and you may get Taysom Hill back. If you have both of those guys back, you get Jamal Williams back, who I believe from everything I've heard and from talking to his mom is going to be back. Um, you bring Squally Canada. I know you only had one play, and it was a disaster, but he's going to be a really good player. And then you've got Francis Bernard back, Algie and you've got Algie Brown back. Nick Curry, and you, Nick have, you have like eight of the ten offensive linemen back that were in that two deep back on the offensive line. This should be an elite offense in the United States next year. So you start with that. So it's like, okay, if you're great on offense, that gives us six wins. Okay, and then how can they be on defense? Well, that's Kalani's deal. That's what he's best at, you know. Will they make a transition to the 4-3? I think he'll have to get in and look at the personnel and decide whether they can make that transition right away. But that's what he's been. He's been a base 4-3 guy, not a 3-4 guy. Mm -hmm. So if if they can be solid defensively, then do you get another? I, I think that eight or nine wins isn't crazy. I don't think it's crazy with what wow. they have coming back on offense. Because I know that all these boring people out in the world thinks defense wins championships. <laughs> but go tell that to Gary Patterson in you TCU. Got points, man. Go tell that to Bobby Stoops in Oklahoma. They will tell you that offense wins championships and puts butts in the seats. And defense <laughs> keeps you in the game. Yeah, That's keeps it. you in the game, That's and then it. the offense wins it. Blaine, as always, an elite interaction here in Studio B. Thanks, man. It's exciting times, guys. Exciting times. It's going to be really fun.